Yes, I first met Ganun 33 years ago. Do you remember that? I remember. I was at that time a brand new New Testament teacher in Collonges, and Ganun was a BA student. It did not take me long to understand that this tall man and thin at the time, at the time was not the kind of student you forget easily. I still remember the first paper I had to mark from Ganun. The topic was the Son of Man in the Book of Revelation. And I should have somewhere the mark and some of the comments still on my file, in my files. A, a few words suffice to introduce Ganun Diop. So I have chosen three words. The first one, Bible. Ganun is a robust scholar in biblical studies. He started with a New Testament degree at Collonges, and then he went to uh, the most prestigious institution in Paris, one of the most, in most prestigious institutions in Paris, the school, sorry, the School of Languages and Civilization of the Ancient Near East. Then he continued to add an MPhil at the Paris Catholic University, and he studied semiotics in La Sorbonne University in Paris. In 95, Ganun got a PhD from Andrews University in Old Testament. Ganun has the passion of sharing the biblical knowledge, his biblical knowledge, with non-church audiences. And I still have the vivid memory of what we put in place together in the city of Lille, northern part of France. We started having a kind of five day long seminar on how to read the Bible for non-believers. And it was, at least for my part, quite successful. Yours, I'm not sure, but mine was good. <laughs> I will tell them later. <laughs> Ganun is still a student and between two planes, he works on another PhD in New Testament this time. Are you making some progress? I will speak before my lawyer later. <laughs> <laughs> the second word is humanity. One of the expressions Ganun favors is the following. We share the same humanity. Whatever the times, the places, the races, the education, the political settings, we are different, and this is the reason why Ganun works to foster mutual understanding between Christian faith traditions and other world religions and philosophies. He regularly contributes to provide philosophical and religious foundations for cross-cultural and cross-political dialogue for the unity of people of different backgrounds. And I have to add to this presentation that it is not a surprise that the words freedom, human rights, religious liberty come at the top of Ganun's lexicon. And what I have to add is that Ganun comes from a Muslim background. No later than this week, Ganun was in Lomé. You know Lomé, the capital city of Togo in West Africa? And he met the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Togo and the Minister of Justice to plead the uh, liberation of this Christian. Is he, is he a pastor? No, not this one. Yeah, he's, a, yeah, he's, a he, he, he's a church member. a church member, you know, uh, in jail apparently for no valid reason. So you spent a week or more in, in, in Lome yeah. discussing with uh, the leaders of this country to uh, try to fix the problem. Shared humanity means for Ganun that the word friend has a full meaning. A friend who shares everything. Nine o'clock p.m. 31st of August 1997. For you, Princess Diana. For me and my family, phone call saying sorry dad passed away suddenly. The first man to call was Ganun. And when some years before, 
we, Catherine and myself, decided to get married. The first person to call was Renoun. Yet, the last word, music. We are blessed, time is short, otherwise he would have come with his flutes and would have started to play something. But time is short. He travels always with a large bag with some flutes and with music inside. So if you have time to... Do you have them in your room? I will not tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> if you want a concert, maybe you should go to his house <laughs> after the meeting. Ganun Diop is a native from Senegal, but so West Africa, but with a French citizenship. He has lived in three different continents and in various cultural settings. He's now, as you know, the director of United Nations Relations for the Adventist Church. So Ganun is married to Helen, who is a psychologist, and they have three children, two boys, Kaiman, Goel, and a girl, Megan. Let me put it this way to conclude. When I am with Ganun, I forget I am black, and he forgets he's white. Please give Ganun a round of applause. The riches images about the church is that it is the body of Christ. And allow me in this context to mention this. That means the church is not a mere non-governmental organization. Whatever the church is involved in is based on a spiritual worldview that is biblically based, Christ-centered, Holy Spirit driven to the glory of God and for the good of his creation. Engagement with any aspect of reality then, whether social, political, legal, economic, judicial, or any other sphere, should be clearly informed by a biblical worldview. Now, in the context of Adventist tradition, my work in particular for public affairs and religious, uh, religious liberty department at the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a foundation, I believe, that is deeper than mere religious freedom, freedom of conscience, or freedom of belief, though these rights, recognized by the international community, are necessary. There are literally hundreds of organizations, NGOs in particular, who put forth significant effort and resources working selflessly and with great sacrifices to promote and protect and defend freedom of religion or belief. Now, we have to recognize that people of all philosophies and religious persuasions affirm, for example, human dignity as the foundation or the reason why they do what they do. To say it more simply, if you ask most NGOs, why do you do what you do? Why are you involved in trying to alleviate suffering, help people, inform them about their rights, they all will talk about, oh, it's because of human dignity. However, human dignity is usually construed from different premises. Now, before specifying the nature of our engagement as some of the Adventists with civil society, it may be worth, I believe, to highlight the values that seem to motivate people, I mentioned dignity, but there are others, people and nations, by the way, to work together to make our world into a better place. A fitting place to take the pulse, then, of what matters most to people around the world is the forum of the pillars of the United Nations. The United Nations system is actually based on three pillars. The first one is peace and security, first pillar. Second pillar, justice and development. And finally, the third pillar is human rights, and even this one can be subdivided into three. Individual liberty, personal equality, and human dignity. Third pillar, based on three pillars. And if you take, again, the individual liberty, that 
concept. It can further be expanded to include three freedoms. One, freedom from want, basically freedom from poverty. The second one, freedom from fear. And finally, freedom to live in dignity. Now, it is interesting to know that violations of any of these pillars disrupt the dignity of human beings, erode the chances for social peaceful coexistence and cohesion. These violations deprive humans the opportunity to live decently and with dignity. If I were to pause to make sure that we are together on this, I just mention what matters most to most people and nations. And to just um, uh, frame it in a specific context, why is it that in 1948, nations gathered and decided that there must be a better way to live together? What happened before that? Two world wars. And before that, religious wars. The history of humanity has been plagued with wars. I mean, the history of any nation, even today when, uh, in the United States, when, when, when we visit historic sites, most of them have stories of wars, fighting, violence. But after World War II, something happened in the world. In particular, when you think about countries like France, for example, two occupations, people had enough of waging wars. Somehow, December 10th, 1948, nations decided to design an instrument a universal instrument, by the way, called Universal Declaration of Human Rights. December 10th, 1948, after World War II, and after the Holocaust, and I wish to continue, and after colonialism, after imperialism, after slavery, and so forth, so on. People decided, instead of waging wars, they would like now to build peace. This is why you have the first pillar, peace and security. First pillar. But soon they realize though that there will be no peace or security if there is no justice and development. Uh, therefore, the second pillar being justice and development. And even this pillar is critical you have heard, for example, uh, talking about uh, uh, the second pillar, particularly the Millennium Development Goals. Before the year 2000, again, nations set aside more than four billion to launch a program that by the year 2015, to come soon, they would like to uh, fulfill a dream that they call Millennium Development Goals. There are eight of them. The first one, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, goal number one. Goal number two, achieve universal primary education. Goal number three, promote gender equality and empower women. Goal number four, reduce child mortality. Five, improve maternal health, because many women were dying giving birth, for example. Goal number six, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Number seven, ensure environmental sustainability. And finally, goal number eight, develop a global partnership for development. Now, most programs connected to these eight Millennium Development Goals are ongoing right now as we speak. 
actually at the UN right now, people are talking about even post Millennium Development Goals. Because humbly, people realize that they will not be able to reach these goals by 2015. Not all of them, at least. Oh, there's progress, unquestionably. But the world is facing uh, still tremendous challenges. Now, I do not need, I, I believe, to spend time talking about the target because those are connected to the, um, to, uh, to the goals, basically, at the UN. Uh, these could be, uh, this is available even online. You, um, but in a nutshell, for our purpose tonight, I would like to then, um, from what I have just said, draw the, um, the, the following remarks. Key among what matters to people today and I'm saying this before even talking about my specific goal or uh, my specific work or the Adventist approaches to, to uh, global relations. I'd like to mention that key among what matters to people and nations are protection of every person's life. Two, health, education, and equality, including gender equality, development, and environmental sustainability. If you would like to, to use the UN to, uh, to, uh, to test or to, uh, to measure the pulse of what is it that people are after, we could isolate this. However, beneath the justification for the need for peace and security, the need for justice and development, the acknowledgement, advocacy, and protection of human rights, there is a dimension of freedom of conscience and belief that is worth underlying. A concept that is given a unique perspective, I believe, in the Judeo-Christian scriptures and traditions. I speak of human dignity. Human dignity is the foundation for freedom, for solidarity among all the people of the human race, and for caring responsibility for the environment entrusted to our care with, with a view of its resources for all to share. Let me then um, make a statement about what is the ground of Adventist engagement from my perspective. Of course, I could use my role as representative of the church to only speak of what was officially voted and say this is the Adventist voice about this or that. However, since I joined this department and allow me to speak in a more personal way or term um, regarding this, since I joined the um, PAL department that is public affairs and religious liberty, I've been developing basically what is it that we have as vision for our engagement. I was given even that assignment to write a uh, biblically, theologically based worldview or vision of, our, of why we engage the UN and other uh, religious and non-religious organization. So I, human dignity is core, is core to everything basically that I do or uh, emphasize. So first then, human dignity as foundation for our engagement at a global level. Peoples from various religious and philosophical backgrounds and persuasions share the belief that the foundations for human rights reside in the dignity of every person. The importance of human dignity is a given when we observe that it is assumed and evoked as justification across disciplines. The concept of human dignity has drawn considerable attention from cross-disciplinary studies and practices. However, even though the human family has benefited from the competence of many people in various domains of expertise, scientists, ethicists, um, ethicists rather, legislators, lawyers, economists, medical doctors, philosophers, theologians, and others, the fact is that from bioethics to court decisions, opinions vary as to the foundation for human dignity. For many, the issue is not only to live, but also to die in dignity, for example. So-called pro-life advocates hotly debate what that means. 
Moreover, is human dignity innate or is it a virtue granted dependent on merits? The issue of human dignity informs opinions about stem cell research. Should stem cell research be limited to therapeutic goals or reproductive purposes? Let me quote Article 11 of the UNESCO Declaration Conference, uh, sorry, the UNESCO uh, General Conference in the Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights in 1997. It states that, quote, practices which are contrary to human dignity, such as reproductive cloning of human beings, shall not be permitted. Interesting. By and large, the position of most of the scientific community and all the, countries, uh, all the countries of the world agree with this declaration today. Of course, there are some dissenting voices. A jury, pre uh, a jury prudential sorry, approach has influenced several debates on human dignity. But even here, clarity of thinking is needed. It has been an important aspect of decision in many cases and numerous constitutional rights or interests have been aligned with human dignity in the last 58 years, we are told. Nevertheless, no organizing jurisprudence is yet discernible. In politics, even democracy is essentially inseparable from the concept of human dignity. Actually, the root cause of suffering, the dehumanization, exploitation of the vulnerable and defenseless, the greed that systematically and systemically causes deprivation of basic subsistence to the poor, the use and abuse of women and children, the desacralization of human bodies reduced to objects of pleasure and disposables, have all the same root, that of despising the truth of the infinite value and worth of every human person. In essence, the dignity of every person. In the African setting, may I quote, Gabriel Ndinga said the following, quote, all being said, Africa works to promote new socio-cultural structures. We think, he said, that the real issue is about individual dignity which is necessary to reflect upon and be respected. The divisions, hostilities, Tribal conflicts, rivalries for the control of resources at local, regional and global levels, the search for power to dominate others and use them for one's own interest, and the wars that inflict incalculable pain and suffering to millions of people on planet Earth are all, are all expression of this one evil. Refusal to recognize and respect the dignity of every person. When humans give in to violence, or are addicted to power, there is no end to indignity. indignity. There is therefore to the need, in my view, to develop a culture not only of human rights, but more than that, more deeply, a culture of upholding, promoting, and protecting human dignity. If you were to ask me at this stage, what is it really that you do? At the beginning, of my work, I used to say, oh, I'm helping develop a culture of human rights. The reason for the title, More Than Liberty, Rights or Respect, is because the more I get involved into global relations, the more I realize there is a deeper level of engagement, that of upholding human dignity. Every people group faces the single challenge that determines the course of every, of every relationship. A critical question of utmost importance is the following. How can the concept of human dignity and its implications for justice and peace be integ uh, integrated into the very fabric of how we think, act, or relate to one another? Success in this area could reverse dramatically several dysfunctions within society. I would like now to then, if I uh, postulate that human dignity is that central and crucial, what is the theological basis for that? In their own way, 
and on their own terms, consonant with their specific inner logic. Each world religion addresses the issue of human dignity. This topic actually provides a platform, I believe, where authentic interfaith dialogue can take place. And that is what I say, that uh, each world religion philosophy has its own inner logic. And they are always connected to dignity. Maybe later in the question and answer time, I'll come back to some of, some of the illustrations. The perspective upon which I would like to focus now is the Judeo-Christian perspective in particular. Now, well-known thinkers from Augustine, Thomas, Aqu uh, Thomas Aquinas, Calvin, to Karl Barth, to name but a few, they all have contributed to show the centrality of this question of human dignity, especially connected to the issue of the so-called Imago Dei, the image of God. Mainstream Christian traditions have all affirmed the centrality of human dignity as foundation for how to relate, treat, and honor the worth and value of all persons irreducible to being objects, political beings, or mere bio, uh, biological entities. The consensus or unanimity of thinkers from all streams of world Christianity is remarkable. The concept of human dignity based on the fact that all humans are created in the image of God constitutes the gift of the Christian world to the world and the best platform where tangible unity exists among those who base their anthropology on the mystery and revelation of God in whose image human beings are created according to Genesis 1. On the Catholic side, the Second Vatican document, Dignitatis Humanae, unequivocally stressed the foundational nature of human dignity. Just briefly to illustrate the consensus from a Catholic side. And the rich Orthodox also traditions on human dignity provide critical reflections on the pitfalls of a one-dimensional approach to human rights deprived of this unique Christian perspective a focus on human dignity. Actually, an Orthodox Archbishop said, human dignity is not some vague kind of civic pride, but arises from the certainty that each human being is indeed a sacred person, the creation of a personal God. Human dignity has nothing to do with egotistical arrogance, but is associated with an awareness of human greatness and its, and its limitation. <coughs> dignity is marked by this question, consideration, and respect for others. The World Con Council of Churches also, especially its commission, Faith and Order, study document um, Christian perspective on theological anthropology can most certainly be considered a landmark publication on the issue. So Catholics, uh, the, uh, the World Council of Churches, and the Orthodox, unanimously affirm the centrality of this concept, actually, that they call the gift of Christianity to the world. Addressing the future of the very concept of human rights in a multipolar world, a world of various religious and secular ideology, John Allen Jr., the Vatican correspondent for the National Catholic Reporter, argues for the need of a, in his own term, quote, Catholic natural law theory and theological anthropology. The, fo uh, uh, unquote. the focus of this endeavor, he suggests, should be on an analysis of the spiritual dignity of the human person rather than political ideas derived from the Enlightenment. His suggestion is welcome, especially in light of the broadening conversation about the universality of human rights, as mainly framed through the lenses of secular rationality. The rich Asian traditions on the issue and Islamic perspectives, by the way, on human rights also make it useful to revisit the specific contributions of, Judeo of the Judeo-Christian traditions in addition to the input of secular ideologies. What does it mean that 
humans are created in the image of God. What does it mean that humans are endowed with, in, with dignity? And why should it be the platform to relate to people, especially in the global arena? First, and I'm going to save time in summarizing the main issues here. If humans are created in the image of God, that means basically to understand who humans are, one ought to take into consideration the revelation of who God is. There is a correlation, in other words. If God is an inner relational being, it goes to say that humans are also called to relate to one another. That's the, na the, uh, the nature of the reflection. If God is, for example, love, as is described in the New Testament, 1 John 4, 8, God is love, then it goes to say humans are also called to reflect those attributes. Who, who humans are can only be deduced from who God is. And we could continue this uh, it affects everything after, let me move on to, if God is the foundations for who humans are, then the way humans relate to one another should be framed in the light of who God is. So, uh, let me give some specific uh, examples here. God is the model of being. So God as mystery, for example, correlates with human nature as mystery. The God in whose image and in, in whose likeness humans are created cannot be confined or defined true. As God is inexhaustible mystery, that is one of whom it is impossible to know everything about. That is the definition of mystery, by the way. Mystery is not something that you cannot know anything about. But a mystery is something you cannot know everything about, and that is a difference. So if God is mystery, it goes to say that humans are also mysteries. I can never get to the point concretely to come to say, oh, I know this person. Allow me to be personal. Even my wife, I cannot say, oh, I know this person. If she stops to be a mystery to me, then I have reduced her to an object. That's an implication of what this means. If God is mystery, so are human. I mentioned this, but let me come back to it. The living God is a relational God within God's being, that is, in a fellowship. The mystery of God is that God is an inner relational being there is plurality within the one being of God. God is not a nice, an, an isolated, solitary monad. Humans are the pinnacles of creation. We were created, therefore, to communicate and in unique ways. The destiny of each person created in the image of God is largely fellowship. The very goal of the whole history is actually fellowship. Even when people talk about salvation, this is a dimension that should not be uh, stifled. But there is another dimension that also informs global relations as far as Adventist perspective is, is, is concerned, at least as I, um, uh, as I live it personally, as I experience it personally. God identifies with every person. He is involved in, huma in humanity's destiny. Actually, a few examples. In the book of Proverbs, just to show the correlation between God's solidarity to humans and what this means as far as human relations are concerned. Proverbs 14, 31. Whoever oppresses a poor man 
insult his maker. But he who is generous to the needy honors him. Another proverb 17:5. Uh, Whoever mocks the poor insult his maker. So here there is a, a correlation. This is not just theoretical for me in, uh, in, in my engagement with people. See, uh, what we do to humans, in fact, from this biblical perspective or worldview, we do to God. Sometime, and I think an illustration can help, I meet with people. I know that they are not telling the truth. I know that they are doing terrible things to other people. But how would I deal with them? As if they are God's personal property or belongings. In other words, I have to respect them regardless in the name of human dignity. Why? Because that person, whatever he or she is doing, is still an image of God. So global relations is not, for me, informed by just uh, lofty ideals, even good ones, but rather a theological anthropology because of the nature of human beings. Jesus himself would say, whenever you did this to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Again, identification, solidarity. And again, he identifies with the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the prisoner, Matthew 25. If God identifies with humans, therefore humans are called to identify with one another. That's the key of all my diplomatic work. Whenever I meet people, wherever I meet people, they have to uh, feel that I am for them. There is a solidarity. And this is concretely what helps me create a positive disposition from other people. Every person. Because I believe every person has this human dignity because created in God's image, regardless of what that person believes, does, etc. So this is not just theoretical, but it is foundational though. Solidarity among humans is therefore necessary. God goes even further than that. He experienced the plight and predicament of humans and creation in order to liberate the world from evil and death. And this, to me, is a ground for affirming human dignity, every person's dig dignity. Because in the Judeo-Christian tradition, God is the model, again, uh, sorry for this redundancy, but I, I need to emphasize this point. Our very being, our values, our doing and behavior have their source in Him. The whole edifice of the Christian faith is built on the premise that God assumed the humanity to model what it means to be human. And therefore, even in international relations, that should be the foundation and groundwork. Ground now, it is interesting, I would like to read a quotation. Since we are talking about Adventist um, approaches to global relations, I think the following statement may be apropos. I quote, an Adventist author, Ellen White, who writes, In the days of Christ, selfishness and pride and prejudice has built strong and high the wall of partition between the appointed guardians of the sacred oracles and every other nation on the globe. But the Savior has come to change all this. The words which the people were hearing from his lips were unlike anything to which they had ever listened from priest or rabbi. And then she makes this stunning statement. Christ tears away the wall of partition, the self-love, the dividing prejudice of nationality, and, touch, uh, and teaches a love for all the human family. 
He lifts men from the narrow circles that their selfishness prescribes. And then listen to this, I quote, he abolishes all territorial lines. Maybe that is what Jean-Claude was mentioning earlier about a deep held belief that I have personally. We are political beings, social beings, but that doesn't tell all our story. <laughs> there is more. So Christ he abolishes all territorial lines and artificial distinctions of society. He makes no difference between neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. He teaches us to look upon every needy soul as our neighbor and the world as our field. So then, through Jesus Christ, incarnation, death, resurrection, ascension, and kingship, God creates a new humanity. One family of people sharing the life, fruit, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. A new humanity where hierarchy is abolished. All people become brothers and sisters. Every person is now endowed with infinite worth and value. This is what informs my relationships at a political level, uh, at all level. Um, just if, if you allow me to be a little bit informal. I was in Togo last week. And I happened to be um, well the, the former minister of foreign affairs of Senegal invited me for supper. And as we converse, you know, he's Muslim, as we converse, we get to the point where we realize there was something binding us that was deeper than even religious affiliations and persuasions. Our common humanity in the first place. Now it doesn't exclude differences and so forth, but there is something, and maybe this is what this is illustrating somehow. I mentioned the love of God for the world, a model for relating to others. It's more than respect. Respect is a minimum. Human beings were created to manifest God's love towards fellow human beings. In fact, the story of the Bible is mainly about the God who is love, telling that he so loved the world that he gave the person of his son so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life, fellowship, in love. He said that already in Israel um, with his uh, covenant people of then Israel uh, in Jeremiah 31, I have loved you with an everlasting love. <laughs> uh, this is something also I use in international relations, making sure to tell people that no human person is an accident. No. Why? Because no, well, God has thought every existence and that puts dignity again <laughs> in every person. Uh, a mother may forget her nursing child, but God certainly remembers, he says. There's another aspect in international relations, global relations, and then I will come to be very specific about what Adventists do in this setting, how in, in terms of engagement with others. That is the generosity of God. It's, it is interesting to see time and again, uh, even right from the start, the first acts of God are acts of blessing after creation. He blessed them now in an impersonal way, talking about animals. But when it comes to humans, God blessed them and God told them. Now he's more intentional about communication and fellowship, but a story of blessing. And the story of all the Bible is benevolent blessing, grace. And I believe this is what the international community is expecting from one another. 
in our engagement, especially global relations, my task specifically at the United Nations and then also toward other Christian uh, organizations and non-Christian re religions is to be the voice of the Adventist Church. What that means, I present to people who we are, sharing. But who we are, I ground it on the basis of what I have just shared. And one of the illustrations that I use, or actually statements, is Adventists are called to be assets to society. And I try to make a case to ambassadors, to politicians, governments, head of states, and so forth, that they would benefit from having Seventh-day Adventists living freely in every part of their countries. And why I can say that now, I can use even the values that you were talking about earlier at the UN and the Millennium Development Goal. Actually, my uh, business card, when I give it, just behind, on the back rather, there are statistics about what Adventists do. Adventists are involved in what even the, uh, what people call the Millennium, the Millennium Development Goals, but just think about it briefly. Uh, first of all, health, hospitals, you know, clinics, and so all over the world. I have statistics, but I'm not, I'm not here to um, be too specific about numbers and so forth. Education, in one of the, uh, we are here in Newbold, uh, at Newbold College, education. Humanitarian, third. Human rights, actually one of the oldest human rights organizations chartered in 1893 was promoted by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then you could add to that woman ministry, children services, youth services, and so forth. These are concrete things about the generosity, at least expected. Now, of course, not every Adventist everywhere is going to have that vision, but that's basically a frame that we could reasonably share. I, I am sharing that with people and say this is what it is really all about. Talking about generosity based on God's generosity with the idea of, ble of being blessings to others. There is a sense of gratuity here, a sense of commitment to the well-being of other people. Um, another illustration why and this is recent and I do that almost every month somewhere in the world I happened to last week being in Togo why um, it is to renew relations with the government after a very difficult case and it is not even over to a certain degree two people imprisoned one is now acquitted the other one is still in prison and so I was mediating on that but I met five government officers, ministries, if you please, minister of the prime minister, minister of justice, the uh, minister for the decentralization and so forth. Why? Courtesy visit to heal misunderstandings to speak in a way that they know that we are assets to the Togolese people. Actually, next year will be the 50th anniversary of Adventist presence in that country. <coughs> and I do this around, the, why? Because this is how we engage people. Again, this is why at the beginning of this presentation, I was saying we are not just a non-governmental organization. There is a religious component to what we do, but that doesn't mean that we are trying to make the Togolese people into Adventists. People are free to choose. Actually, one of the principles in the third pillar that we defend is freedom of religion. Freedom to believe or freedom not to believe, by the way. 
people have that right. Why? Well, this because of this now other component in God that humans should reflect. That is, God is free. If God is free, humans are also created to be free. Why? The goal of creation is fellowship, love. The issue though is love cannot be forced. <laughs> I cannot come to my wife and say, you have to love me. It has to be a free decision. So the same thing, the whole covenant concept, the whole uh, engagement in being in a relationship with God is based on that premise that love cannot be forced. So therefore, people ought to be free in, in order to choose. Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states very explicitly about freedom of religion, but even more so, something that is resisted, by the way, by some of the nations, in particular some of the Arab nations, uh, Muslim, Arab Muslim nations. Uh, the Article 18 states that people have the right to change their religion, change their religion. But there are some countries who are resisting that, resisting that. Why? Um, just as an illustration, I was at a meeting in, in, in New York at the UN, and um, the special rapporteur was, was presenting on this very issue. Uh, and there were some African head, heads of states, and I took the opportunity to say that um, it is an insult to African nations and leaders within their self-determination and so forth to allow some Arabic countries to I mean, this kind of clause or dictate uh, uh, their right to change, or I mean, uh, to prevent them from changing religion. It is an insult. Why? Both Christianity and Islam are not indigenous to Africa, right? Important religion. But for whatever reason now, how can some people come and, you know, as Muslim and say, you cannot change your religion. If you are a Muslim, you have to stay a Muslim. Mm? It is an insult to human dignity. It is an insult to human freedom because freedom includes the right to choose, the right to change. Otherwise, people live beneath the dignity for which they were created. Now, another aspect here is of importance. The root of all this is that every person, because God who created humans is holy, sacred, I'm not talking about pietistically, I'm talking about the, the the sacredness of life, every person is sacred. Now, it would be very easy to convince, in particular, Christians and even those who place high value in, um, in worship places, temples, so called. Humans are called temples of God. So that means they are sacred, more important than buildings, more important than shrines, more important than mosques every person yeah. and it's because the, 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 the that that sacredness is not respected that we defile people that we insult people that we demean people and indignity takes its place see uh, i have chosen to speak this way so that that um uh, I may actually have an opportunity to show that Adventist approaches to global relations are grounded on a biblical worldview that informs everything else. Everything else. But if humans are sacred, of course humans can defile themselves. <coughs> but that should not lead me to despise anyone, regardless how low they become actually, in terms of betraying their own God-given dignity, or if they are believers, dignity still from a humanistic or just enlightenment perspective, which I do respect. It has brought a lot of good. You know, we have to understand that the world we live in did not just happen like that. If you realize that 
religious institutions or people did not really live up to even the project that they wanted to push forward. In the setting of France, before the law of 1905, you know, separation of church and state, there was some statements such as, oh, civil peace is too important to leave it in the hands of religious people. Why? Because of wars of religions, fighting, the killing between Catholics, Protestants, and etc., etc., etc. They know civil peace, take it away from religious people. I was in Spain recently presenting on human dignity, and uh, the chair was the special rapporteur of the UN. After the meeting, um, he is a Catholic theologian and, phil and philosopher, was mentioning we are like a rare breed because even in human rights culture, people tend to stay you know, on general principles, but rather, uh, rather than what, why do we do what we do? How should we do it? Well, one of the things is considering people as sacred, every person, and therefore people should, cannot be violated. Summary, five minutes, thank you. Literal minutes or, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, not apocalyptic, okay. So summary of, find, of findings. Adventist engagement or approaches to global relations have theological foundations. Fundamentally, human dignity human worth and infinite value, and that is every person. Humans are created in the image of God. Humans are created to relate, of course, for those who believe to God and to one another. There is one human family, one human race, despite what history has taught. Humans are sacred by virtue of the fact that every person is created in the image of God. Every person, therefore, ought to be respected. It is interesting, many people talk about several commandments in the Bible, including what, what is I mean, mainly known as the Ten Commandments. But there's one specific commandment that is so critical to human relations and it is found in First Peter when he declares, honor all people. Honor all people. What a program, what a challenge. Every person we meet to be honored. This is not some idealistic uh, um, you know, dream. But maybe people even can change by feeling that they matter. They are not objects. <laughs> it was Immanuel Kant, you know, say whenever we start instrumentalizing people, we actually deprive them of what is foundational, that is their dignity. <coughs> Let me just mention this. Every person then should be valued, honored, respected, loved. And to fully experience God-given dignity, then of course, freedom is a must. As I mentioned earlier, love cannot be forced. Human dignity calls for respect, for justice, for peace to be enjoyed by every person. We live in a difficult world. We live in a complex world. I could mention inventories of suffering, um, violations of people's integrity, mm. wars and the ills of wars, genocide and so forth, so on. But at the end of the day, it's all about how can we make this world into a better place? There's um, an emphasis among Adventists about hope. Yes, hope for a better world. 
However, this hope for a better world is no distraction to work concretely to make this world into a better place for all. And this is why whether health, education, whether humanitarian or human rights or various services, the root of all this is the upholding of human dignity, not only a developing a culture of human rights, but more foundationally, a cult of human dignity. Every relationship that I have in the setting of my work, that is my stated, my hidden goal. And at the end of the day, I want every person to feel, and that is also what I share with Adventists in particular, do your best to create a space in others for freedom, that they are not threatened, that they can be free with you, accepting. If we do that, then we go beyond tolerance and all those words to respect and even understanding and even love. So briefly, these are basic ideas I wanted to share. It's more than liberty. It's more than rights. It's more than respect. Especially when you realize in, the, in this whole paradigm that I shared, humans are important. So much so that a Christian can give up his own freedom for the sake of others. A Christian can give up his or her rights for the sake of others. Actually, we're living in, the in a world where 75% of the world population live under some restrictions to their rights, especially religious freedom. 75%, that's three-fourths of humanity. However, some, even though in difficult si circumstances, are still praying for those who persecute them, for those who violate their rights. And they are still respecting them, even more so. They are still loving them. We are not just involved in a secular dipl diplomatic work. We do it based on values and premises, of course, that we have in common with others. We love peace, yes. Security, yes, first pillar. Justice, of course. Development, of course. How about the third pillar? Human rights, of course. We support freedom of conscience. We support freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom to live in dignity. But we do it on the basis of the revelation of who humans are, based on who God is. That is the groundwork and foundation of our work, of our relating to others. Thank you very much.